So there were uh, a lot of commodities that were rather scarce or even non-existent in the 18th century, 18th and 19th century. And one, one of the most rarest commodities was money. So people bartered. So I had a good friend, Ryan. He, uh, he did a lot of work helping me out with the project. And, uh, and I asked him what I owed him and he said a knife. So I'm building a gift here for Ryan. He wanted a skinny knife. We're gonna do sort of 18th century style maple handles. We're gonna do it all period. And what I found since we've built this blacksmith shop, I've sort of dismantled my modern ones. So things like cutoff wheels and welders and belt sanders are a thing of the past. So what I'm finding as I progress in learning the skills of the 18th century, uh, it takes a whole lot longer. <laughs> I mean a whole lot longer. So they say that in a blacksmith shop, um, as often as you'd hear the, the clink of the hammer on the anvil, you'd hear the rasp of the file. So uh, I've pretty much got this shaped out. Um, I'm liking the shape of it. I've got the uh, wooden handles roughed out for it. Uh, and now it's a whole lot of filing. And then we'll get onto the handle. I'm gonna do some aquafortis on it. I'm gonna do it like they did by passing hot iron over it to, to stain the wood. And then uh, I'll sew it up in a little bed and I think they call it a sheath. And I'll, I'll gift it to my friend Ryan for his, his efforts here. Once I get the blade up to temperature once more, I'm going to anneal it. So I, I just use wood ash. Uh, it's what they would have used. And uh, I'll let it sit overnight. Take it, it'll take it quite a few hours to be cool enough to touch. Uh, then I'll get on with the filing and then uh, hardening. And then the final step will be tempering. And then uh, the finishing steps will be putting the handle on and, and sewing that leather sheath. Okay, so I'm bringing the, the knife that I've formed up to temperature. I've preheated the oil. So this is the hardening process, and we use oil because it's going to quench it much slower. So if we use water, which is a really rapid quench, like we would use for fire strikers, um, we're going to end up warping the blade and probably get a lot of stress fractures in it. So I'm just bringing it up to an orange, red to orange temperature. We're going to quench it in the oil. We don't move it around in the oil because that also will warp the blade. Okay, we, we know it's hard because the file's skating pretty good on it, but the next step here is to uh, polish up the part where we want to um, follow the tempering process. And um, in modern times, one would, would simply put this in a tempering oven for, for 45 minutes or so. The pioneers didn't have that, so they, ha they relied on color. So what we're going to do is we're going to slowly heat this from the thick part to the thin portion, and we're going to watch the colors bleed. So we're looking for a bronze a bright bronze on the very cutting edge, uh, fading to blue, so uh, into the tempering process.
So I'm <clears throat> starting to get a bit of bronze now, bleeding from the thicker part into the, the cutting edge portion, but we need a little bit more. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do now is just let that bleed into the part I polished and we'll see if we can get that bronze color to, it's going to move from the thicker part where it's hot into this thin portion of the cutting part of the blade. So what's happening now, the handle, the thick part there, I, I need to do a little bit more color at this part of the blade. So that, that part will slowly bleed down and I'll get that copper blue uh, tempering color that I'm looking for. And uh, we're off to uh, next step is to make handles, uh, put the pins in, uh, probably about an hour, hour and a half of filing because I don't have a belt sander anymore. Uh, and we'll have a knife finished. I don't even have a maker's mark made yet, so I'm going to have to work at that. So I finished the, the scales or the knife handles um, for the new knife. Uh, get them mounted tomorrow and I should finish it up and be making a sheath next. Uh, so a wee bit of history. Uh, and, and typically I research things. I try to find first person accounts, dates, times, places, and all that good stuff. But today I'm going to tell a, a wee bit of fiction. And there's a guy by the name of Jack Dury wrote a fictional novel called The Blacksmith of 1776. And I've got a little Irish blood in me, so I might be embellishing a bit. I think it's in my DNA uh, that I do this. So we have a young journeyman blacksmith. Uh, and for the past year, he's been training with the militia. And his master blacksmith that's trained him is their captain. But as war breaks out <clears throat> and they're ordered to get on the move, the master blacksmith is ordered to stay back in the blacksmith shop and make armaments. The young journeyman becomes the regimental blacksmith and starts following the army. So the old master there, he gives him a wagon and an old horse and 100 pounds of bar steel and offsets the young fellow. Off he goes following the army. Now, he doesn't have a lot of stuff and, and, and a lot of tools. He got an old 100 pound anvil and a few tools he was saving to start his own business. And they, they get to a point where they set up their, their first camp, but he realizes as they're, well, I should say on the approach, they're, they're going to their first camp, he realizes he needs clay. So he asks the colonel if he can stop at the next creek and get clay, and the colonel says, you've got 10 minutes, we don't want any stragglers. Uh, so he stops, gathers as much clay, he doesn't even have a shovel. They get to the encampment and he starts forming the, uh, the base for his forge, and he meets this young 16-year-old carpenter who's not only carrying his musket and his kit, but he's carrying this big wooden box with all his carpentry tools in it. He says, I'll help you. He says, if from now on, you carry that wooden, wooden toolbox in your wagon. I don't have to tote it. So they struck up that deal. They build the box. They form the clay, and he's, he's got a fire started in it to harden the clay, when in the distance they hear the, the sound of the muskets and the cannons going off. And they're, they're working away at this and then all of a sudden the battle turns and they hear the command for retreat, retreat. And as they come into camp, uh, they're saying, pack up, get going. He's throwing stuff together. He's trying to get everything in this wagon. They retreat. Uh, they set up the camp for the night. And there's no revelry in the camp that night like there was the previous night. This is the first battle for these soldiers. Many of them are wounded. They're groaning and moaning on the ground. And the only other sound you heard all that night was the ring of the anvil. As this young fellow repaired cannons, uh, carriages, wagons, re-welded chains, hardened frizzes, fixed muskets. And finally they see this kid needs some help. So, so a lieutenant appoints a fellow to give him a hand. The two work all night. And just at dawn they're told to be on the move. Well, half the stuff isn't fixed. It gets left, all their tools get thrown in the wagon, and they retreat. So, so as they're progressing following the army in their wagon, uh, the young fellow looks back and he sees his musket there that he trained for, and he, he's pretty distraught because all his local people he knew, his villagers, his friends, perhaps relatives, they were out there fighting, and there sat his musket unused. And then he realized that they didn't bring him there to fight, that they, um, they brought him there to make sure others could. 
And to add to his anxiety, when he glanced back at looking at the musket, he saw this 16-year-old carpenter's toolbox there. And he realized, my, I didn't see him after the last battle. So when they're set up the next camp, he's inquiring around, and he finds out that the, uh, that the young fellow, much to his emotional distress, had been killed on the battlefield. So the war goes on for eight years, and you can picture this young fellow. He starts out at maybe 20, 22 years old. He's now almost 30. Uh, he's dirty. He's cold. He's tired. Uh, he, he's between retreats or going to battles. He sleeps sitting up on his wagon as the horse pulls the makeshift forge and uh, bellows along behind. And it's a reflection, I guess, of what it would have been like to have been a blacksmith in that era. And if, if we think about it, uh, you know, what started out as this young man's passion for a trade, to become this journeyman blacksmith and ultimately a master blacksmith, um, now becomes simply torture for him. His body's racked with pain. Um, he works through the night when they're in the battles. Uh, he, uh, anyway, the bottom line is um, we, we think about the glory on the battlefield. That's what we see in, in documentaries and we read in the history books. But a lot went on behind the scenes and that truly would have been the life of a blacksmith in 1776. So there we have a finished uh, 18th century trade knife. Uh, and I spent about an hour and a half honing that and it's razor sharp and I'm gifting this to a friend and I'm giving him a lifetime warranty on sharpening. So, well, as long as I'm alive, I'll sharpen it whenever he needs it. And right now you could shave with this guy. Um, but so the, the, the knife, the trade knife, it's, it's interesting because most um, tools have a name. You have a hammer, you have an edge, you have a broad ax. And this was shipped in the ledgers of all the companies as a trade knife. But it was more commonly referred to in the New World as a scalping knife. Yeah, I'm going to get into that in a minute. But to show you how prevalent this was uh, in terms of a trade item, during the heyday of the fur trade, so 1780 to 1840, uh, literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these, were shipped from England and France to the New Worlds. And uh, and a good example would be Fort Detroit in 1783, 1782. Uh, on their ledgers, they show 11,820 knives. And that was enough until the next dog was shipped in, in 1783. So just one fort, if you think of all the forts, the outposts, the trading centers, uh, probably millions of these were shipped. Uh, which brings me to, to, to what they were used for. So they were a butchering tool, of course, skinning. Uh, but scalping, um, we think of it as only an indigenous thing, or the natives did it. Well, it was far from that. In fact, the taking of scalps actually turned into a business, and, and quite a business at that. And uh, I'm going to get into a little bit of that. So I spend a lot of my free time, or spare time when I have it, uh, researching history. And I find all those good tidbits of first-person history, but ah, I've been known to embellish, so uh, you should pay particular attention to the parts that I make up. Uh, but this part I'm not making up. So um, very soon I'm going to be heading down to Prickett's Fort in West Virginia to the School of the Long Hunter. I got myself registered for that, and uh, a, a wee bit of history there is in 1779, uh, a wounded Indian in an attack, there's a wounded Indian, some farmer kills him. And they just didn't take scalps. This, this poor poor fellow, they, they actually skinned him. And that skin was, was tanned. And they would make belts and straps and bags. And apparently, uh, there's an existing piece that has survived, and it's in the hands of an ancestor of that farmer that skinned the poor Indian. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a brutal history. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about now is, um, is rather disturbing, I guess. It, they were indeed turbulent times. Some of the first references to, to the taking of scalps um, as a bounty or, or payment would be in the uh, Pequot Wars of the 1630s, where the Mohican natives were paid money to bring in the Pequot scalps. And then we, we move forward into the Susquehanna Wars, uh, 16, um, 1675-1677, 
And it's the first time we see records um, uh, on the Massachusetts legislature about the payment, payment for scalps. And then we keep going. I mean, this is, uh, we get into, let's see, the French and Indian Wars, and you've got uh, uh, Shirley, who's the governor of the state of Massachusetts, and he's put out a bounty on native scalps. So he'll, he'll pay 40 pounds. That's a lot of money for an adult male scalp, and he'll pay 20 pounds for a female or a child scalp. And we think it's over, and now we've sort of we're we're moving along. We're getting a bit more civilized, but it, it carries right on into into the American Revolution. Just before I get into the American Revolution. Um, there's a Peter Kowski who's a, a, I'm a big fan of his music, wrote a song and one of the lines in his song, and this song takes place in the French and Indian Wars, he, he goes, the king's great halls are not lined with gold but with the scalps of those along the Ohio. And that pretty much sums it up, um, the trade in the, in the human scalp business, if you would. At the time of the American Revolution, the Lieutenant Governor of Canada is a fellow by the name of Henry Hamilton. And I, I should point out before I get into Henry uh, that the scalping or taking the scalps was much more prevalent on the British side than the American side. Um, the British saw it a way to, to um, take the scalps and diminish the the effective war machine, if you would, of natives that allied themselves with the Americans. And in fact, by American patriots gave O. Henry a nickname there, and they called him the hair buying general. And he was captured during the war, and uh, instead of being held as a prisoner of war, he was charged with uh, war crimes. Um, yeah, anyway, very, very few people um, actually ever survived. Uh, being scalped. There's very few actual records of that, but occasionally. And uh, there was one fellow by the name of McGee. He was scalped in um, uh, early 1800s by a Lakota chief named Little Turtle. And he survived, lived into his 60s. Uh, yeah, a sad, a sad time, a turbulent time. And uh, fortunately now, <laughs> that no longer has two names. It's just known as a knife. So I'm looking outside at, at an absolutely grand spring day. Uh, I'm hearing sandhill cranes in the backdrop. A couple of days ago, I got to witness about 10,000, had to be 10,000 tundra swans migrating to the Arctic, uh, which was pretty amazing. But before I go, I'd like to give a shout out to an amazing group of historians. And any group that is trying to keep history alive is a friend of mine. And the name of the group is Heritage Days History Symposium. And I've put a link, to, and to get to that, if you go to our homepage, The Woodland Escape, go to Channels, click on that, and then you can click on the, the link to the site. Uh, they're a not-for-profit uh, uh, channel on YouTube, and uh, they're not trying to take your money, they're just trying to keep history alive, as I say, and they'd sure appreciate you having a peek, and if you like them, subscribe.